Okay. Um, don't leave yet. We still have our panel. Um, so that will be led by Callista. And um, so I please come to the stage. And the um, speakers on, or the panel members are Luis Carlos Bosque Perez from the EU Commission, John Davis from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Roger Esparza from Semidynamics, um, Daniel Op Opaika from the Euro HPC, Patrick Pipe, which we already saw from NXP, and Stefan from Tech University of Munich. No, Munich University of Applied Sciences, sorry. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Oops. No, no, none here. of us look like her. I may have a problem when I go back. Why is okay. it? It's it's an old man. Well, at least he's not old man. Because the panel open now? We can swap. I can swap. We can swap some people out if you like. Yeah. <coughs> oh, there's Callista. She's over there. Oh, there she is. is. She's actually. There she is. Okay. What do you mean by that? <laughs> There's no balance. We're running. <laughs> yeah, right. But I have to leave at 6.15 sharp. <laughs> Hello, my friends. Hello. Oh, she got mics. She's ready. I'm, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I didn't realize they were going to get all the things rearranged so quickly. This is a lot of us up on this stage. <laughs> it's a little tight, but we're gonna get there. So thank you everyone. I think this is our last official session for the day, and then we get to go have a really nice time this evening. So thank you for hanging in there. Uh, we've got a lot of great things to share. I'm excited about this panel. Um, you know, when it comes to bringing RISC-V global, the roots of that in Europe are so critically important. So we're going to kick off. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about your, who you are, the organization that you work with, and the importance and gravity that you're feeling about RISC-V in Europe, and what, you know, what is your perspective from your organization on pushing that forward. And then we'll get into some questions. So uh, we'll start off with Luis Carlos. Uh, thank you, Calista, for giving me the floor. Uh, I indeed am Luis Carlos Busquets Pérez, and I work for the uh, European Commission in the unit called Cloud and Software. Uh, before you start thinking that I am just a bureaucrat, I have to clarify that my background is indeed of technical, of engineering. I'm telecommunications engineer just from a university that is less than five kilometers from this venue. Uh, it's not a, a big distance, but it's certainly bigger than the three, less than 3,000 meters that separate this venue from the place where I was born. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's go back to business. I'm working for the European Commission, and as public administration, the European Commission has a duty towards citizens, in particular to your, towards the EU citizens and has a duty to provide uh, freedom, to provide the conditions and framework so that uh, citizens can enjoy and, and have possibilities, uh, in, 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 which translates in economic terms, in more jobs, in better economy. And it is from this point that the European Commission is interested in ICT technologies, and specifically uh, now also in risk five. Huh? It's not only me who has come from the uh, Commission today, but actually there are more colleagues, Matthew, uh, the, uh, who pronounced the, the keynote, and, and also uh, uh, colleagues from the HPC unit 
who are here because we see risk five from many angles and it's very interesting. In particular, the unit uh, in which I work, I'm working uh, sees uh, the potential of risk five uh, in relation to the uh, study that we published on the economic impact of open source. Uh, that was on, in September 2021. The study basically confirmed that the open source has got a very important economic impact in the European uh, economy and also showed that there are some trends that have happened with open source software that could now replicate with open source hardware. Indeed, open source hardware is maybe we could say around 10 years be, uh, be behind open source, but if the same path uh, uh, is followed, then a big impact in the European economy could happen. And that's the reason why we're interested in uh, risk five as, as uh, uh, the possible uh, open source hardware that would complete the stack. And I'm referring to the stack that the open source communities have managed to build. Open source uh, communities have managed to build the stack from the kernel up to the application. However, below the kernel, this is still closed. And below the kernel is where RISC V has got something to do. And, and that's the reason why through the European uh, uh, Processor Initiative uh, for HPC, we, are, uh, we started funding, actually, ideas on, on this. And uh, also, through Horizon Europe, uh, in the work program 2022, we started thinking of saying, well, why only HPC? Why don't we expand the possibilities of Risk v to uh, cloud computing? Because let's uh, be clear, if we develop a processor, we have to look at what is the market processor in the world. And out from the around $80 billion uh, that was in two th 2020, half of these well, processors are for, well, certainly tablets, certainly uh, industrial applications, but half of this is computing, which should not be any surprise to anybody. And that is precisely the reason why the Commission is, is at this, eh? about, about the, pos the economic possibilities that Risk V can bring to the European economy. Thank you. And uh, John Davis. Hello, my name is John Davis. I work at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, it's just down the road. Come visit us. We're hiring. Uh, we do everything in HPC. Um, I look at a bunch of different things uh, with regard to um, open computer architectures. I lead the laboratory for open computer architecture at BSC. We look at RISC V as an enabling technology and a language for us as researchers to communicate to industry new novel ideas and proofs of concepts from hardware all the way up to the applications on the top. I think if we look at what BSC has been doing in the last decade or so is really looking at how do we um, provide capabilities to uh, students as well as to Europe and really all the things around digital autonomy. Uh, we've been advocating for RISC V for, for that time. Uh, we're excited to see the traction. We're welcoming all of you here. So thank you for coming and joining us in Barcelona. It's a very exciting event to see such enthusiasm and excitement. But fundamentally, I think the next step is how do we work together uh, to do that? I lead a bunch of different uh, projects um, at many levels uh, from smaller processors like eProcessor to FPJ platforms like Meep. You saw a talk hopefully earlier today. I'm involved in EPI as well and some of the next uh, initiatives that we think can go uh, forward. Fundamentally, we're proposing that RISC V is the basis for all future research and technologies in Europe. So the beautiful part of that conversation and the fruits that have been bared from that are things like EPI, things like KDT. So if you look at all these things, there's been a lot of messaging uh, from Barcelona and others around uh, how RISC V can change the world. So we're happy to be a part of that. Thank you, John. Roger Espasa. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Spaza. I'm the CEO and founder of Semidynamics. Uh, we do uh, RISC V IP. We have uh, uh, two cores in order out of order, a vector unit, and we also try to be very active in the European uh, landscape. I think Alista sort of um, had a question like, okay, what's uh, RISC V to Europe, or how do we get Europe into RISC V? Um, I think, you know, RISC V is the only option for Europe. There's no other option, right? So it's, it's a very simple equation, and I think 
Uh, here we have to thank uh, BSC and Matteo especially. 2015, uh, he started pushing the commission uh, and pushing, 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 and more pushing, and even more pushing. And now, you know, the commission is fully on board. And that's the, and I'm very happy because it's really the only option. And uh, we can name the other ISIS, it's not, it's not a problem. Intel, not an option for us. ARM, not in Europe. <laughs> Actually, it's in Japan right now and could end up in uh, maybe in the US. So what else are, is Europe going to do other than develop an industry around race five? So it's very easy. It's a really easy policy choice. Normally, policy choices are very difficult. In this one case, out of necessity, it's trivial. It's the only thing Europe can do to try to regain its position in computing. Now, around the computing, there's more things. There's analog IP, there's foundries, there's, you know, a lot of other stuff. Those are not strictly RIS-5. And we heard in the last talk about the CHIPS Act. Those also need a reinvigoration in Europe. But at the center of it, you've got to choose what are you going to be computing on. And I think all the computation in Europe, or sorry, all the computing devices produced in Europe and hopefully used in Europe, but they can be used in other places, should be must be RIS-5 because it's the only open standard we have. I always use the word open standard and to be a little bit, um, um, you know, to try to generate some non-consent. <laughs> open source <laughs> is not what's important. What's important is what's open standard. I know half the room is an open source lover, but what works for software doesn't really work for hardware because there's the annoying little detail of the 30 million tape out cost, right? So no, open source software is not the same as open source hardware. Open source hardware is super useful, but what's valuable about RIS-5 is that it's an open standard and anyone in Europe and the rest of the world can decide to start um, a project tomorrow, company, private, non-private, and use RIS-5. So I think that's, that's why, that's definitely why I'm doing RIS-5. <laughs> And that's definitely what I think Europe uh, must be on the RIS-5 uh, RIS work. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Daniel Palka. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Palka. I'm working for the European High Performance Computing Joint Undertaking, where I'm the, the head of research and innovation. The EuroHPC Joint Undertaking is an, a funding organization, an EU funding body. We support research innovation projects, but also have a mission to deploy infrastructure. So to summarize, we have overall about three key areas of our activities. The first is to increase the capacity in Europe on HPC resources that will be made available free of charge for open research and development purposes to all our communities, but in particular also to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, for example, to industrial users, and of course, the public services and the research communities. Beyond deploying infrastructure, we also have an ambitious research and innovation program where the ambition is to develop a significant part of, our, of the technology that we need for, for our future high performance computing infrastructure. And this is a part where RISC-V plays a more and more prominent role in our activities. And then of course, we, uh, we also address the challenge of talents by supporting the development of skills in the union. We uh, have a, var a variety of activities in this area from a European master program for high performance computing to a pan-European network of national competence centers supporting local communities in the adoption of high performance computing and related technologies and a lot more. Thank you. And uh, next, Patrick Pike from NXP. Okay, thank you. 
so my name is Patrick Pipe and I'm working for NXP Semiconductors, which is a European semiconductor company, uh, one of the leading companies in automotive semiconductors, but also active in other types of semiconductors in telecommunications, industrial applications, health, etc. Uh, I rolled in into the RISC 5 community, so to speak, some two to two and a half years ago, when I was invited by the European Commission to moderate a workshop uh, to trigger what is the interest of the community uh, into RISC 5. And I remember at that time, the interest was quite limited. It was like interesting perspective, but yeah, okay, let's see what's happening. Uh, in fact, some companies, universities, really wanted to do something, and that's how this working group was created, who uh, made this roadmap in Europe on uh, what are the future needs and the future work to be done. And to be honest, I was very pleased that after two years, there is a lot more interest, and there are companies coming to me. Yes, we had no interest in the beginning, but now we really would like to engage in European programs. And so that's part of my job, to find uh, interesting partnerships to create new funded programs in Europe. And I'm very pleased that uh, both the Commission, also some national authorities and industry is now very keen on uh, applying Risk 5. Uh, we are not, in fact, stating that Risk 5 is the ultimate solution. Let's be fair. We believe that there will be a balanced portfolio of different types of processors but we believe RISC V will be a very important player in that portfolio of processors to be used in different applications. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Stefan Wallentowitz. Hi, I'm Stefan. I'm an open source lover. So, <laughs> sorry, um, I got involved in open source silicon 15 years ago um, in Open Risk, something nobody knows nowadays. But it was the open source ISA before RISC V. Um, we were involved in open cores, and I. Evolved from there in, uh, into founding the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation, where I'm a director right nowadays. Um, I fully agree with you, Roger. Um, uh, open source is not everything. I think it plays an important role. I'm very happy to see that the seeds that we planted hopefully get incorporated and uh, we can build on it. Um, it's important to say that this pipe is really an open standard, right? It doesn't. It encourages open source. Open source is important, and I think there's a lot of value in there. Obviously. Um, since 2014, I'm involved in Risk V. I represent the individuals on the board of directors of Risk V. I'm unfortunately, I have to say, and that's maybe my opening statement, um, one of the very few European representatives there. I think there's only two or three, maybe, I forgot. Um, and it's a pity that the individuals are the ones that are represented. Uh, of course, I like the individuals and I represent them. Um, but I would have liked to see other companies that are in the room uh, being more involved in the entire um, standardization process, everything from the beginning. But what I believe, and I think, I feel that I'm maybe the right person to represent Europe then, because I think it's very individually driven until recently, um, the whole involvement in Risk Five, mainly not by individuals as in hobbyists, like I used to be sometime, uh, but mostly because it's an R&D thing, right? I think that was pretty clear from some of the statements that, and we saw before, right, it's one of the weaknesses that we have when it comes to ships. Um, everything is very R&D driven, which is good, yeah, but it doesn't create the economic drive. And also it doesn't lead to involvement in the standardization process because it feels you like more like a consumer. And um, I'm ha very happy to see, and I hope to see it even more in the um, projects in the European Commission design, et cetera, that it also incentivizes getting involved in the standardization process. I think Jeremy said it's, uh, you should avoid committees. I would say you shouldn't <laughs> because it's very important work. Um, I think there's a lot of work that got into the risk five spec and I hear Europeans complaining and I'm looking at the mailing list and I don't see many European email addresses there and I'm wondering why is that and why do we wake up so late and um, yeah, maybe we can discuss this a little bit too. And I'm a professor in Munich. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, you like move to the last item on the list. Like, what's the call to action? Get involved, get engaged, join the board, join a committee. I'm with you. All right, so we're gonna dive in. I know, I've got a massive panel here, so if you wanna make a comment, uh, you know, show me a sign. Uh, first question, uh, Europe is trying to close the gap in the semiconductor markets. What role does Risk V play in giving Europe a chance to regain control over its own destiny? <laughs> Sounds like a commission question. We, we answered that already, 100%. Well, if, if you 
If you have a specific thought on, on something here, that would be great. And then I suppose I, I should answer. Eh? And actually, I, I will answer with uh, what we've heard from different stakeholders uh, in the latest events that we've organized in the cloud and software domain. And it is not that RISC V is uh, something spectacular from a technological point of view that has never seen uh, humanity before. But, but simply that it's the only, uh, uh, what it seems the only viable economic choice uh, to actually have a possibility to compete in a domain uh, which is now closed to European uh, companies and the European headquartered companies. That's the reason why we see uh, RISC V as a possibility. Also, the fact that it's an open source ISA gives, uh, well, a, a more easy way for others to try to come in and compete uh, in the same market. Note that uh, we are not uh, evangelists of open source. Eh? It's not open source what we are claiming, but we are not uh, also naive, and we've seen what has happened during the last 20 years. Eh? If there were big ideological fights uh, at the beginning of this century on open source, yes or no, what we now see is that everybody actually is using open source somewhere or, or some way or another. And all ICT companies are taking them in their strategic plans so that either they rely on it, uh, they use some part, of course probably the, the parts of the, their product that provide added value they will not open source. But that, there's no problem, because as long as we see that uh, the open source correlation uh, with the economy is positive, that means that the more things that are in open source, even if it is not everything, well, the more competitive economy that we're going to have. The fact that Risk Five is an open source architecture will probably then correlate. Huh? That's, uh, that's the idea, with uh, an increased economy, with more innovation, uh, better jobs and a uh, better economy. That's, that's uh, what we want. Maybe Thank I you. can add a thought. So from a technical point of view, from the beginning of Risk Five, it seemed to me like it's made for Europe, right? Not only because of the economic background, I mean, but I think European defines itself, and especially from Germany, we define ourselves very much in domain-specific knowledge. We know, and we know the industries, right? That's sometimes how we try to differentiate ourselves from Americans and Asians. And I thought like risk five is ideal, right? So why do we even discuss about other architectures anymore? Uh, like you can do the domain specific parts in there that you need. You can do application specific CPUs. Like this would unleash a lot of innovation. And uh, like this was five years, uh, no, eight years ago already. <laughs> and I see like it's getting, it's getting more and more at attention. I hope for the right reasons. That's sometimes what I'm not really sure. Um, and it, I, th I think there is more in risk five than Europe has used so far, and I'm sometimes, to be honest, I'm a little bit wondering why it needs public funding to get to this innovation, right? Like, uh, like this is, like, if I look at like, the, all the German companies, they define themselves by their pride and, like, the innovative character. Like, RISC-V creates this innovation naturally, in my opinion, and um, maybe others have other opinions on the, on the panel, but that's what confuses me sometimes, to be honest. Patrick. If I may complement to that, uh, I think from a technical innovation perspective, I think that's the right solution. But technical innovation is not the only thing that business is growing uh, from. And I think the main reason that Risk Five is of interest to us is it's never good if you are too dependent of one specific processor vendor. And that's why, in fact, we were looking at what are alternatives, and there do not exist many. And I think Risk Five, therefore, is a very good solution because it's an open standard, it's a lot of innovation, and it's also a big challenge on the other hand, and that's what we should, uh, and there I would not agree with your statement about the public funding. I think there is still a lot of work to be done on Risk V to make it a really industrial supported processor to be used in different application areas, especially, for example, in automotive. We had a lot of discussions but you cannot apply risk five as is towards the automotive world. There is a lot of work to be done on safety aspects, security aspects, quality specific aspects. And we all believe that it is possible to do so. And I think that's currently 
the, uh, the impetus we have in the program that a lot of stakeholders in Europe believe in it and that we cannot do it alone. Therefore, we need to work together to come to a solution. And I would say even more, uh, what I find very interesting is that even the communities of automotive and high performance computing start to talk to each other, which was not the case in the past, in my opinion, and learn from each other. And I think that's the important aspect by learning, by building synergies, by investigating what is common, what is complementary, uh, we can be make a big stack in Europe. But this will require uh, effort from industrial players, universities, research institutes, and of course also from the European government and the national governments to really get to a concerted effort to get uh, Risk V uh, alive and kicking in Europe, I would say. So I think one thing that I draw from every one of your responses is that there are a lot of different stakeholders, right? A lot of different stakeholders with a lot of different perspectives across many different industries, even just sitting at this table. And what's important here is that you're adopting a global standard. This is not a Europe standard. This is not just by Europe for Europe. This is Europe building on a global standard that opens up global opportunity. Opportunity for development partners, supply chain, markets, you name it. You want to participate as you grow your technical economy locally, you want to participate in that global uh, vision and future, regardless of your stakeholder position. Now, just about everyone has come up on this stage and said, hey, I need talent. I'm sure there are folks in this room who are saying, hey, I'd like a new job, right? Well, let's talk about how do you bring all of these stakeholders together. So next question, how do you academia, business, and policymakers truly work together without slowing one another down to get the most out of this opportunity? What is that collaboration vehicle? Sometimes it's committees, others have said, avoid the committee, right? <laughs> so what is, what is your answer? What is your perspective? And that's an open question. Well, maybe I can start on that one. And I believe the, the organization I'm affiliated with, the EuroHPC joint undertaking, is one example of this collaboration that so far has been very successful. Uh, we are formally a public-private partnership. This is a special type of organization created out of the European institutions. So we have stakeholders that are public entities, countries. In our case, we have 33 participating countries. But we also have private partners. These are currently three industry associations, the European Technology Platform for High Performance Computing, the Big Data Value Association, and the Quantum Industry Consortium that, together with us, design our, our work program the documents, our, our strategic agenda, how we support and develop the European ecosystem and along the entire value chain of high performance computing. And this, of course, this collaboration and consultation process with our stakeholders involving SMEs, private companies, academia, as well as public authorities helps us to convert research into innovation and uh, one example is, for example, the European Process Initiative is probably one of the first large-scale projects that we have launched in Europe with a very significant component on Risk Five. I'll touch on the talent thing. I think one thing that um, I've mentioned in other places is we we're lacking. Well, there's a, there's a general um, you know, uh, decrease in uh, STEM careers, so science, technology, math. So that's a problem because obviously fewer of those people than less come to our area. But I do think uh, policymakers could help in creating a curriculum that's uh, straightly focused on something that's easy to understand called chip design, right? So it's something that we really need is, um, at least in Europe, uh, slightly different than the US, I don't know, um, Far East, well, in the US, here we got computer science, we got something called telecommunications, which is not 
in the US and we have something that's electrical engineering but not the same as the US. And those three things form the basis of what this room do does, but there's no clear curriculum for a young person of 18 years that's looking at the options for their future and say, wow, I hear all these things about AI, cheap design, where do I go? Should I go computer science? Should I do telecommunications? I call on the, you know, those that have more power than me to help create a, a curriculum that's clear and obvious um, pointing to this direction. Of course, there's someone in the room still gonna say, give up, chat GPT is gonna do everything for us, and <laughs> that is possible. But meanwhile, while we wait for ChatGPT to do all our chips, um, a, a focus curriculum, at least in Europe, would really help increase the amount of talent we get to work on this. John? Start with your kids. Instead of having Legos, we can build processors with RISC V. <laughs> that's kind of where we need to be, right? That's, that's the interesting thing of just starting that young to educate them and have them be able to play with things that they can create at any level, software or hardware. So I think when you look at this, as is echoing what Roger was saying, we need to go through this whole process of making it cool and exciting to build technology to create uh, and have the flexibility to add your own special sauce. So when we look at this and when we have conversations at BSC, it is what's the undergrad curriculum to address Roger's uh, question and how do we build microelectronics processors, architecture, those components. How does that feed into the master's program that Daniel was talking about for high performance computing? Um, that all is the engine to get the supply there. And then we have the talent in building the teams and the companies in Europe to have places for them to land versus in the US. Uh, and then we can then use those companies to define the next generation of research problems. So we have this very nice cycle that we can build uh, in Europe where it starts when they're three or four or five. And instead of putting the Legos together, they're putting pipeline stages together. They're thinking about software and how to build that. This may sound ridiculous to you, but there are programs out there that allow your kids to build different types of challenges in software. Why not extend that to the rest of, of, the, of the whole pipeline and what we think of technology today? Let's not make it a block black box, let's make it open, uh, and RISC V, I think, can do that. So I challenge everyone to say, hey, to your kid, your niece, nephew, someone else's kid, uh, this is this cool thing you can do with RISC V. Uh, and then we just build that cycle, right? Education, undergrad, grad, companies, research programs, it all comes together. So that's what I would suggest. How many tape outs did Professor Bao have his students oh, do? I'm it's just amazing. saying, there are some models out there. Yeah, it's getting there. I'm just going a little younger. A little younger. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah actually, actually uh, this kind of submit is precisely uh, uh, a way to see that without doing anything, already we see academia, industry, uh, all kinds of stakeholders together for the sake of risk five because it's something that is important and interesting for all. Anyway, as, as mentioned by, by the other panelists, uh, the commission is indeed actively uh, uh, supporting this uh, interconnection between different stakeholders. The Euro HPC joint undertaking is an example, but also the KDT joint undertaking is another example where we bring together stakeholders from different domains uh, in, with a common goal. And also under the research framework program, we are running projects precisely to join the consortia with uh, members coming from the academia, uh, research institutes uh, and industry uh, for common goals and concretely uh, for risk five on the, the work program 2022 we're already funding uh, the the way to to expand the results of the european processor initiative into the cloud domain and under the the work program 2024 we're going again for a second step to uh, ensure that risk five has got uh, the adequate uh, range of uh, stakeholders uh, already pushing for the gaps in research that are still uh, to be fit. Patrick. Yes, first of all, I fully agree with you, John, that uh, you have to start from very early stage with kids and students. 
Uh, one additional element uh, I would like to emphasize is also how we can influence the media more effectively in bringing positive news about engineering, about the use of semiconductors. Because if I look to television, I only see engineers on television to explain why a bridge collapsed or why a train accident happened. Uh, every time there is a disaster, I find there is not enough news about what the engineering community in our sector brings to society and helps to progress the society. I know it's difficult, it's not easy, but uh, I think it's an attention item to investigate how we can have the media bringing more positive news of what engineers can bring into society. It's, you have to make it positive and sensational so that it grabs headlines. Stefan, last comment on this question. It's not on this question, it's the other one. Oh. Um, <laughs> I've lost control. Uh, no, um, I think the joint undertaking are an excellent vehicle, and I think you've emphasized the role of academia in there, but I wanted to take the opportunity that you are here, and I think it's more addressed to, to Matthew. Um, from academia, yeah, the, the funding rates of the joint undertakings are, pardon my English, shitty, right? So it's a lot of discussions we have to have. It's very hard for us to, to get into the projects, not because we don't have topics, it's mainly because we have to fund it ourselves. Right? And academia, we don't have funds, right? It's, we are very famous for this part. So, and if you look at the role, especially in Europe, like uh, what Uni Bologna and uh, ETH have, like the whole risk five ecosystem as exists nowadays seems entirely dependent on academia. So I would strongly, uh, or like mildly, ask you to reconsider funding rates in a ship's or and undertaking. That's, that's my, sorry. You, you got some claps there. Good job. All right, we're going to move on to the next critical area, and that's commercialization. It's not just how do we collaborate to get something moving and to move it forward, but what can we do to spur commercialization? When I look at the three regions that we predominantly focus on in Risk Five, the North America, APAC, and Europe, North America and APAC have largely like fostered their uh, Risk Five uh, movement on commercialization, where Europe has been largely academia and research driven. Now, how do we ignite that commercial aspect? so that uh, the economic engine is really uh, jump-started. Uh, commercialization. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> by, by European, is it? <laughs> no, I mean, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting cycle being there, a small startup trying to sell uh, Risk 5 IP. Um, the big companies that could buy those things, automotive companies, we heard how difficult it is to be automotive grade, uh, functional safety grade. So there's a long, long pipeline in the automotive um, world that many of the small companies that are starting on RISC-5 have a hard time having the pockets, the money, to go through that pipeline. So that's a problem. Say, okay, something else, HPC. Well, HPC, boy, that's dominated by a company called NVIDIA. Ooh, how do you get there, right? Uh, and the procurement in Europe are very clear. You shall buy the best possible object for the amount of money you're given. So there's no tick saying, okay, you can get a 30% discount in performance if you buy European. So that's also a problem, right? So, okay, that's not it. Um, then Industry 4.0, okay. You keep looking and there's so much uh, pressure and good pressure and uh, from commercial offerings from the US and, and APAC that it is hard to foster your own industry. So, so it is a tough uh, little fight that uh, Europe has to somehow, you know, bend the rules a little bit, make sure that the local production starting in academia, for Stefan, uh, <laughs> continuing in the open source and then going to commercial, that needs, you need to water the plant so that it grows. So it's gonna take a little bit of a while. And there's a lot of pressure coming from these two other regions and rightly so, they're trying to sell into Europe. So there's no way we can tell them, don't do that. So we got to keep, you know, helping the locals <laughs> produce something that uh, is going to be taken by the locals. So have you seen any particular, you know, incubators, incentive programs, things to try and help get some of this off the ground? Uh, are, there, are there some, uh, you know, incentives that are Definitely. Available? I mean, the commission is putting lots of programs and they're doing a good job. 
Uh, in Europe, we're always a bit slow. Everything is a bit slow, so <laughs> increasing speed would be good. But no, the, the, there's a lot of help. So there, there's no complaint other than it's going to take a while and more, more euros going into the problem. Yeah. So I think maybe uh, you can add to this, but in general, I think um, a role that is not fully played in Europe at the moment is the role of procurement, right? There's public procurement. And if you look at data center, like HPC is nice, but data centers might be even larger market, right? And there's public procurement and it's needed. Like we talk a lot about digital sovereignty and building data centers. And if you speak to people that build data centers, they don't know about RISC-V, they don't care. Like they just buy what's there, right? But when the public builds a data center, I would assume that you could put some pressure on the way that you incentivize, in some way at least procurement decisions being made in a direction that the entire stack is digital sovereign. It's not only this part. It's just my opinion. John? Yeah, I think there's, uh, it, it basically boils down to euros uh, at various stages in the pipeline. So from the VC process uh, and creating that, uh, which is lacking in Europe for uh, high euro cost. I mean, we saw Dr. Bao's uh, chart yesterday. Uh, there are no billion euro funded uh, startups in Europe, right? I mean, that's that would be fantastic and amazing. Um, the support on the research side is great, but we see this TRL chasm, technology readiness level, lots of support to get to five, no support to cross the chasm from five to seven to get to production in eight. And uh, so that's the, the interesting thing. Uh, we've been proposing from BSE a tied procurement and development phase, so that if you hit uh, development targets and KPIs, then you have a guarantee uh, some type of procurement in the supercomputing space. So fundamentally, how do we enable the SMEs, the small and medium enterprise, to have incentivized and well-defined projects that lead to customers, that lead to sales, that then they can use to raise money? So we've broken the cycle in terms of being able to have a space where you can grow uh, beyond just a seedling, all right? You get up, you grow, and then you get chopped down because uh, it's very difficult to compete um, with existing people. And, and this is now a, a question of digital sovereignty, uh, digital autonomy, how do you even get there? So if Europe is serious, they will create incentives and programs. I mean, we talked about some of them today uh, from the JU, IPSE, there's a whole bunch of other things, EIC, EIB, right? But the numbers have to be much, much larger than they are uh, today, and, and we have to be aggressive. Incentives and inspiration at all parts. Inspired when you're very young, then some scholarship, then some incubation, then some procurement. And we've, we've got it. The ball is rolling. Any other comments on commercialization? What's it going to take? What do we need to look for? Patrick? Yeah, I think if you look commercialization, uh, there are different aspects there. First of all, you have, in fact, startups, which are very important if you tackle new domains. Uh, and we've seen that in Risk Five, there is a lot of startups who work in specific niche markets, which who work on specific technologies, and with whom we are also working together as a large company because this is some feed for uh, new thoughts and for new innovations. Uh, secondly, you have to build enough critical mass, as was already stated, in specific application domains. And for example, I mainly specialized in the automotive application domain. There, Europe is very strong, but this is also a slow path because you start in the semiconductor industry. An OEM will not care about an ARM or a RISC V. Although I recently had some discussions where they indicated we have to go to RISC V for sovereignty purposes. So there is already this cultural change that they are engaging in projects uh, with RISC V. And this is a slow path, which uh, will still take a couple of years because there is still a lot of work to be done. And especially if you look at the support, you really need a company, an ARM-like company, uh, not the same structure as ARM, but which is supporting uh, the solutions towards the end customers uh, because they will not use uh, technology. Uh, they will experiment with technology from academia, but they will not use it in a commercial product. And therefore, you need some companies that really support this from an industrial perspective and on a longer term uh, in order to make it commercially successful. 
So one thing that's often overlooked in Risk Five is you said you need a company, but one of the great advantages of Risk Five is that you have competition, right? You don't have competition between ARM and Risk Five. You have competition. There's multiple IP vendors in Risk Five. I think there's a great value in that in itself, right? And that's important to emphasize, maybe also when we speak about the commercialization, right? I can add something uh, on this as well, and I think it was clear from the comments that have been made on this question that is also the, to make this successful, it needs a balanced development of the entire supply chain. So it wouldn't help to have the best chip available tomorrow, but there is nothing around. And this is uh, something that, where we try to contribute as the Euro HPC joint undertaking in the context of high performance computing and of course together with our partners in the European ecosystem. We also, uh, of course, use the links that exist between the different European institutions, uh, and we have examples where participants in our projects, for example, then have funded beyond our research grants through the accelerator program of the European Innovation Council that has been mentioned already, through loans de or debt financing through the European Investment Bank. But one of, the short, one of the challenges that we see still, and it was mentioned, I think, by John, but by several speakers, is the lack of private capital. And this is something, for example, we as public organizations can very, it's very difficult to address. And this is perhaps one of the elements uh, that we still have to find solutions in the future. Thank you. And to uh, several points here, Patrick and Stefan especially, there, you know, there are more design houses on Risk Five than any other architecture in history, right? And over the last several decades, there have been about 50 different architectures. So this is a hotbed for entrepreneurs. This is a place where you can find your niche and really grow and build that as a business. Which leads us to our next question. So, you know, there's so many industries and so many areas that we can go after. Are there any specific industries that you think are the spot to go after or high, high on the list of priorities? And where does AI play into this? It seems like everyone's presentation has AI involved, and uh, you know whether you know at, at any part of, the, of compute. So, what does Risk Five do for AI in particular, and any other industries, and in, specifically where you think this is uh, most fitting? I will start. <laughs> <laughs> I think data centers are very important. Um, I was not convinced, to be honest, six years ago that data center is even um, a market for risk five because it seemed too complex to me. But if you look now, we had the, I think the ITRS published that by 2030 we have 10 times as many ships as we have now. I don't think it makes sense to first tackle those where you already have ships. It's more like, what are the new chips that we have for the future? And AI, obviously, is an important part there. And I assume there will be many, like what Facebook, uh, Meta, sorry, does now, um, building like with five plates data centers with highly specif specific chiplets, like the stuff that you are building, right? Um, um, to their demands, to their applications. And I think there is hopefully more demand in Europe on this topics too. And I would assume this could be a core market where risk five can be very successful in Europe too. Not saying that the others are not important, but saying replacing like ARM and the microcontrol application and the motor control is a very long venture and there's no imminent need for it mm -hmm. beyond technical, uh, beyond political uh, discussions. Um, but there's like 90% there's like of the chips that we see by 2030 are up for grab. And I think those are the ones that will be mostly risk five then. Go ahead, Patrick. Yes, from my side, I don't think there is a real killer application or a killer application domain. Uh, I think Risk Five can be used everywhere, uh, from a low end to very high end type of applications. And AI, uh, it's very easy. It's everywhere, so I think uh, it can be embedded. It is being studied in all different types of application domains. So uh, this is also independent, in my opinion, of the processor architecture. 
and AI and RISC-V uh, typically are a good marriage. So uh, that's something we should further envision. Go ahead, Roger. I, I, actually, I think we do have an opportunity, RISC-V, and this is not Europe and not policy. We do have a, a RISC-V foundation opportunity to do a good job on AI. The presentation on RISE was also very interesting. So the union of the RISE software effort and a good AI ISA foundation, open standard, would allow us to take a step forward. What, if you go back with every, in, from 2017 to now, everyone that said I'm gonna do an AI chip has suffered a couple of problems. First they said, okay, my chip is better than yours. I invented this little tiny hardware thing that in the end was completely irrelevant, uh, be deeply offended, but it was irrelevant. And then the big task was, oh my God, how do I get TensorFlow or PyTorch to run on my little tiny difference? So here at RIS-5, if we standardize and we get the software going, we could really overtake all the other ISAs in, in, in really quick. I think it's happening, but I sense, uh, I'll be controversial, I sense reluctance on the different IP vendors like, do I participate in the standard effort and we all have the same AI instructions or do I push mine as better? So that's a, an interesting little tension we gotta solve in the next six months. So it's not the year, it's six months. There's a seek about that. And I do think there we could have another extra push, not that RISC-5 needs any push, but if you wanted an extra one, I think that's, that's the thing to have, have the software going and be able to tell the world Oh, if you go RIS-5, PyTorch works, TensorFlow works, your favorite framework works, that's, you know, yet another nail in the coffin for the other ISAs. Go ahead, John. So I, I totally agree with Roger. Uh, getting to a software compatibility of no vendor lock-in would be huge, right? I mean, that's going to enable a lot of different things. I would just echo that with money, right? So if you look at all of these startups that are trying to achieve escape velocity, it's 500 million, billion dollars, right? It's not a small chunk of change um, for these high performance recommendation systems, what have you. Um, there's other opportunities, I think, on the IoT side, but it'd be very interesting to think about uh, AI from the edge of the device all the way into the data center, and what does that mean from an ISA perspective? So just to add a, just a bit to what Roger was saying, but um, we still need the money. Go ahead. And, and of course, from a public administration perspective, uh, we love competition. And of course, vendor login is not something that we like. Actually, when there's some kind of vendor login, then you can start interrogating yourself on whether uh, there is a, a situation of abuse of dominant position. Therefore, uh, the fact that uh, Risk Five uh, goes to uh, an architecture that is common to all vendors is uh, basically a guarantee eh, that uh, what is going to happen is fierce competition, which is certainly something that not only we like, but we actually encourage eh, for the sake of having better products, better services for EU citizens. All right, any other comments on industries, AI? All right. Uh, Luis Carlos, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off on this next one, the, and probably our, uh, one of our last questions, and we'll open it up. Uh, there have been a lot of funding projects by member states and the EU. What do you see as the most successful parts of the European model of uh, EU funding? Well, actually, we have many different ways of funding. Yeah? We have from the joint undertakings that have been mentioned where, well, the industry has got a quite relevant and important uh, uh, decision uh, uh, capacity on what is going to, to be done, to the co-program partnerships from the research framework program, to also to the direct grants that the European Commission is giving. Uh, all these mechanisms, of course, have got their uh, uh, the advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of a joint undertaking where the industry is actually pushing in a certain direction is that you know well that the industry is uh, indeed going in the direction that the market is, uh, is leading, or otherwise they will face actually the, the problems. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we fund directly through Horizon Europe for grants for specific research challenges, yeah, of course, uh, the, the challenge of bringing the research results to the market is still there at the end of the project, of many projects. But, but of course, that is because uh, we also use the different instruments to fund different technology readiness levels. Huh? Well, uh, we want, uh, well, for example, through, through innovation actions, we, we fund uh, uh, higher uh, technology readiness levels that with th through RIAs. Yeah? And now through the Digital Europe program, we actually are going to, well, we are funding actually implementation, which means that basically we're funding things that are uh, in the market yeah? for building capacity. And uh, having the possibility to actually adapt the funding scheme to the uh, specific research uh, level on which a certain technology is and uh, to the, the state of the market, I think it's, it's the biggest uh, strength that uh, the European system has got. Thank you. Any other comments on, go ahead. I would like to, also add that the one of the strengths that the European funding programs provide is a structure to organize uh, the support for our research and innovation communities. The European Union with its institution has built up, uh, for example, an evaluation system that the countries trust to be fair, transparent, and provide equal opportunities. And this is uh, something I think this provides a great value for collaboration, cooperation, and also to find consensus when it comes to agree on common objectives in our activities. And you, we have 33 participating countries currently in our, in our governing board, which is the highest decision-making body in our organization. And it is necessary to, the agreement of all these countries is necessary on certain objectives to proceed and be successful. And this is only possible through the framework of the EU funding programs. Go ahead, Patrick. So in my opinion, uh, the European programs are indeed very positive. You can find a good mix between small scale, very focused projects versus uh, bigger projects with uh, enough critical mass. And I think that's important. If you really want to change the game, then you need projects with enough critical mass to reach the end result and not only small scale projects. I think if I may add one, uh, I would say improvement within Europe uh, is the synchronization between the European Commission and the national countries. I think it's very positive they talk, it's very positive they align, but the speed of the alignment is sometimes a bit too slow according to industrial norms, I would say, and that could be a potential improvement action that uh, national authorities are much more uh, flexible in order to align with the Commission. So that is really uh, an improvement action for me. All right, I'm going to cut off the question and I will give each of you about a minute and that'll take us over, because we're a lot of us. We'll, uh, give a minute on your final thoughts and or call to action. What would you like these folks to take away and go off and, and do? Go ahead, Stefan, start with you. <laughs> I don't have the time to think about it. Yeah, I, I would really, I think I repeat my opening statement. And um, I would like to have European colleagues on the board, um, not because I like them more, I feel a little bad because like everyone else has to get up early or late and I'm in the afternoon. <laughs> and I, uh, in the beginning I was only a European and everyone had to adopt after me, it seems. Um, so I would be happy to see more Europeans more strongly involved with Risk Five in terms of standardization work. You can see an uptick now, but there's so much work to do in standardization. There's so much work also in strategic alignment, right? The, the boards, like I don't do standardization there, we do strategic alignment. And I don't want you to rely on me <laughs> to do that, right? Like, um, you can tell me your strategic input. I'm always open to all input. Um, but in the end, I represent the individual community, which is not something I would want European companies to rely on. Thank you, Patrick. 
So my, I would say, three recommendations are communicate, communicate, and communicate. I think it's very important to keep talking, to find synergies, to keep talking between different types of communities, uh, to define common areas of interest and common programs. And I think with the evolution I've seen from uh, two to three years ago since now, I think a lot of progress has been made and we have formed a good base to really make Risk Five uh, a larger success in Europe. Thank you. Daniel. Uh, I see the Risk Five initiative as a, a, with great potential also uh, for our activities where we have the possibility to pool resources to provide significant funding and also continue follow up our research and innovation program with the procurement of real high performance computers. So uh, in this regard, I'm looking, I'm very much looking forward for the evolution of the RISC-V ecosystem. Okay, I'll focus on the young people on the room. Uh, all this policy and money thing is really boring. You're all sleeping, uh, but don't worry. RISC-5 is super cool. As a technology, you should be working on it. You'll be able to create really incredible things because it's open standard. You can extend it. So if you're young and you're here, you're in the right place. And, um, and keep, keep punching on it. It's, um, it's really going to be exciting. So wait, can we just say Risk Five is the new killer app? It is. Okay. It is. All right, John. Um, yeah, no, uh, we'll we'll go on the Risk Five is the new killer app. I, I think that it's participate, uh, fund, uh, and get involved. Uh, Europe has a unique opportunity to influence the future of computing for the world. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, uh, and it's up to us to put the bodies in the places that can contribute. So from that perspective, everyone in the room can have that opportunity to play in your favorite playground and influence the future of computing, both from a hardware as well as a software perspective. So even though we talk about chips, the software is just as important. So uh, there should be room for everyone to play and contribute and have fun. Luis? Yeah, actually, when I hear uh, the RISC-5 is cool, well, I, I feel a lot of envy because I cannot play with RISC Five as much as I would like due to my, my position. But anyway, uh, what uh, what uh, I would like to, to say is that well, do not forget that RISC Five is certainly a new processing architecture that can be used for many different applications. Uh, but well, uh, our commissioner had got uh, an intention, and it's to bring digital sovereignty to Europe. And because of that uh, ambition, uh, do not forget what is the main uh, application of processing uh, technologies that basically is, uh, well, it's, it's actually the computation uh, uh, sector. And uh, of course, we look forward to, to be able to build cloud computing infrastructures on the basis of risk five processing architectures in Europe, uh, which will basically uh, simply uh, bring Europe more choice and the fact that you have elections that you can can have a choice that basically means that that you're free and of course uh, we are the land of freedom with, with respect to the USA <laughs> freedom of design it's one of our bedrock statements about risk five so I'm going to close us out by reiterating engage engage as a member Become a member of Risk Five. Lend your voice, your leadership, your talents, and bring it yourself some of that eminence in return. And then engage in the European Union uh, calls that they are, you know, the proposal uh, process and the funding mechanisms there. There are many to pick from. And then, then of course, engage your three and four year olds or whatever three and four year old you see. All right. That's it. Thank you so much for joining us in this last panel of the day. And I believe I will see all of you in just a little while in a fancy venue down the road somewhere. There's lots of instructions for that over in the uh, entry area. So thank you. Why are we always stuck and running from the pool there?